Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we're going to shake up the format a little bit uh, in this session. It only seems appropriate. And um, usual cliches seem even more appropriate about fo trying to follow Yehuda Bauer. It is worth noting that uh, two days ago, Yehuda accused me of living in the 19th century uh, in terms of my embrace or lack thereof of technology. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, I think, a very appropriate uh, warning call that he, he, uh, he presents to all of us today. My name is Alex Maws. Uh, in my day job, uh, I'm head of education at the Holocaust Educational Trust in the UK. I'm here today, I suppose, in my, in my capacity as the head of the education working group at the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and a long time, as a longtime member of the IRA Committee on Anti-Semitism and Holocaust Denial, which as uh, you know, is sponsoring this conference. So in light of this topic of digital media and, its, and the use and misuse of the Holocaust, I, I thought I would give you all of the, uh, the Twitter names um, and, of course, the IRA hashtag as well. For those of you who want to tweet about this panel, it would be most welcome. Um, do please live tweet. We, we will, that, if you have your phone out, it makes it easy for us to assume that that's what you're doing and not, you know, just that you're bored. Um, and if uh, I could just ask for those of you who are going to be uh, Instagramming uh, this session, my preferred filter is Valencia. So please, uh, <laughs> if I could just politely ask you to do that. Um, it's not a competition, but um, I suspect that of all of today's topics, the realm of digital Holocaust discourse uh, probably surpasses the others in terms of the sheer quantity of examples that we could cite. But it's not just the quantity of these examples which causes us to have this discussion. I think that the, the nature of digital media uh, is more likely perhaps than some others to cause some sense of moral outrage when we see examples of Holocaust discourse there, perhaps because it's more temporary or informal or seen as frivolous. Um, I wanted to uh, show you something that Rob Williams, who will be chairing the, the next panel, sent to me just this morning, a, a Facebook meme that was doing the rounds just last week. Um, this type of thing, you know, might elicit a chuckle and it might elicit outrage. I wanted to show one example very briefly from, from YouTube of uh, a very popular meme there, which is, some of you might be familiar with, the, uh, the downfall parodies, uh, where, and this is with total apologies to the German speakers in the room who will know better, but the, the joke is that uh, if you don't speak German, then the, the subtitles provide some possible humor for you. Uh, here's an example. <laughs> Im Süden hat der Gegner Zossen genommen und stößt auf Stahnsdorf vor. Der Feind operiert jetzt am nördlichen Stadtrand zwischen Frohnau und Pankow und im Osten ist der Feind bis zur Linie lichtenberg marsdorf karlshorst gelangt. Mit dem Angriff Steiners wird das alles in Ordnung kommen. Mein Führer, Steiner, Steiner konnte nicht genügend Kräfte für einen Angriff massieren. You get, oh, sorry. you get the idea, or maybe you don't get the idea. Cause, um, the, uh, what do we make of this, anyway? Is this offensive? Is it legitimately funny? Does it in some way or another actually contribute to someone's understanding of the Holocaust? I think these are all legitimate questions and I'm really pleased to have a very interesting panel today with us today. I should say to those of you who are live tweeting, please do not hashtag all male panel us. Um, 
we had some late changes in this, and it wasn't intended to be so. I'm very sensitive to, the, to that issue. Um, joining us today, we have Rafael Pankowski, who is an associate professor at Collegium Civitas in Warsaw, and he served as the deputy editor of Never Again magazine since 1996. He's published widely on racism, nationalism, xenophobia, and other issues. We have uh, Andre Obler, who is the CEO of the Online Hate Prevention Institute, an Australian charity combating all forms of online hate. He also serves as the co-chair of the Working Group on Anti-Semitism in the Media and on the Internet at the Global Forum to Combat Anti-Semitism. And from the UK, Joe Mulhall is a research and intelligence analyst for the British anti-fascist organization Hope Not Hate, who are very active on social media. And he is also currently a PhD candidate and visiting tutor at Royal Holloway University of London researching post-war fascism. So three experts who are very involved in the social media realm. And um, I'd like to make this session maybe a, a little bit more interactive if we can. It does involve a, maybe your participation as well than some of the ones we've had so far. So I'm gonna ask each panelist to please uh, take five minutes. We're very pressed for time. Uh, for a, a brief opening statement talking about your views of the, the topic, digital media and its use or misuse of the Holocaust. And then we'll have follow-up questions. I've got some prepared if we need them, but maybe the audience or you panelists yourselves will have them of each other. So um, if I can ask Rafael Pankowski to, uh, to speak first, please. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Um, it's an honor for me to be here. I wouldn't miss it for anything, even if it meant um, going by a night train, arriving this morning, all the way from Warsaw. Um, but it's also a bit of a déjà vu I have, uh, sitting next to André, talking about anti-Semitism and racism on the internet. It reminds me of two years ago, uh, the World Jewish Congress session in Budapest. I don't think the problem has disappeared in the meantime, so we should do some more talking. Um, as it was mentioned, I am a member of Never Again, uh, which is a Warsaw-based NGO that is um, a monitoring and educational organization based in Warsaw started in 1996, so around the, the same time when the internet became popular. Um, we are active in Poland and sometimes in the broader region of Central and Eastern Europe. In 2004, we started the first campaign in Poland uh, targeting the issue of um, online antisemitism and racism under the simple title, Delete Racism. And in the early years, we managed to remove several hundred uh, Polish language websites that had racist and anti-Semitic contents. Uh, our, our campaign also led to several convictions. But in the recent years, uh, we found that this kind of work has become more and more difficult. Um, we observed, the, we witnessed the changing nature of online antisemitism and racism, the intensification, the proliferation of this type of content online. Of course, not least uh, because of or through social media. And in the recent weeks, especially, uh, we witnessed a, an unprecedented wave of hatred and racism uh, in the social media in the context of the refugee crisis that also concerns Poland, even though, as Konstanty Gebert mentioned, those refugees tend not to go to Poland. But what I, what I wanted to note in this context is the tendency for uh, Holocaust imagery, Holocaust symbolism uh, to be used 
in, the, in this very recent context, also against non-Jews. Reference to Auschwitz being already built, being ready for, um, for contemporary use. Uh, again, if we go back to some of the issues that were raised earlier uh, today, we might say uh, we are witnessing a kind of universalist use of Holocaust images, Holocaust symbolism by neo-Nazis and racists against non-Jews. Um, earlier this year, we uh, recorded a modest success, uh, which was Poland's ratification, eventually, of the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime, including the additional protocol on fighting uh, racism on the internet that many of you are aware of. Uh, well, it took Poland uh, 13 years to ratify this convention after it was signed, before it was ratified by the parliament and by, by the president. It took us several years of campaigning and as it often happens, it is a kind of bitter sweet success. Uh, uh, the convention is there, the protocol is there, they are ratified, but they largely remain on paper in terms of application of the legal framework that even before Poland ratified the convention, of course, prohibited incitement uh, but those, those regulations remain largely on paper. They are uh, enforced very infrequently. But we believe that the, the very fact of existence of the Council of Europe Convention, the very fact of the existence and the ratification of the protocol on, um, uh, on racism uh, gives a potential for awareness raising uh, in the law enforcement community, uh, in the uh, business community. Uh, so it's a tool that we are hoping that we are uh, going to use in the future uh, for those purposes too. Now, I just wanted to uh, mention one specific example that you might not be aware of uh, that I think gives an interesting insight into the globalized reality of online racism and the distribution of uh, messages uh, through, um, uh, through, through the internet in a, in a globalized uh, context. Um, there is a company in Poland uh, called Allegro, which everybody in Poland knows because uh, according to different estimates, it has about 90% of the market for online sales on any product. If you buy something on the internet in Poland, nine out of 10 cases, you buy it through this uh, platform, which is a massive platform for all kinds of goods. Uh, unfortunately, it is also a massive platform for the uh, uh, distribution of neo-Nazi and racist materials in all forms, uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of um, music, in terms of um, uh, in terms of stickers, in terms of anything that you can think of publications, of course, anything that you can think of that has a, a racist and, and, and neo-Nazi message. And I thought I, I would just show you one out of dozens of examples that's actually online just now. It's a live link if you click on one of the links on the computer over there. Sorry, yeah, it should be here somewhere. Uh, it's, it's actually our website, and the next one is the Allegro service for selling materials. This, this is on sale now. If you want to buy stickers for your helmet, uh, <laughs> it costs only eight zloty, which is less than three dollars. Um, if you scroll down, I'm not 
doing it for profit, so uh, my <laughs> advertising, advertising is very innocent. Right. Uh, if you scroll down, you, you just see it's a big choice, and if you, it's, 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 it's a lot. It, it, every day you can buy hundreds and hundreds of products with this or that uh, neo-Nazi and, and racist and anti-Semitic message, uh, anything that you can imagine. Uh, now, uh, it's, it's a story that has uh, taken us some years of, um, um, and you know, some, some years now that, that, that we spend our energy on it, talking to the company, uh, five minutes, yes, uh, talking to the company, trying to persuade them it's actually wrong, it's actually against the law, it is something they don't agree with, but what, what they also did in reaction to, um, to criticism is they, uh, they took legal action against the critics. Uh, and just this year, the, the, the Supreme Court had the final ruling saying, luckily, happily, uh, it is not illegal to criticize this, uh, uh, but the, uh, uh, the problem persists. The distribution of, uh, of, of racist and, 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 and neo-Nazi material through this massive, massive platform persists. And the, just one last detail before my microphone is cut off. I think it's actually very interesting in this context. The company is owned by a South African corporation, uh, Naspers. Uh, you may have heard of it by its original name, National Press, which in the bare language means the National Press, which used to be one of the pillars of the apartheid system as, as the biggest media company in apartheid South Africa, right until uh, uh, the, the democratic transformation. If you read the uh, Desmond Tutu uh, book on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, it actually has some passages about this very same company that uh, was forced to apologize for its role in the apartheid system, but today persists in a very stubborn way uh, to peddle racist and anti-Semitic and neo-Nazi material in a very distant market uh, in a very distant place, distant from South Africa, um, which is Poland. And I think, and this is my last sentence now, I think this is one of the ironies of the internet today, which uh, um, we thought, I thought, many of us thought, would be a perfect tool for increasing uh, intercultural understanding. In fact, uh, we are uh, increasingly aware it has become a perfect tool uh, for the globalization and internationalization of anti-Semitism, racism, and neo-fascism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Um, just if anyone does have questions that they would like to submit via Twitter, I will definitely read them out loud. Um, and apologies to Joanne Wood for the five minutes that you say it took you to compose the tweet that you just posted. Um, but well done for, for persevering. Um, thank you for that very much. And uh, we're now going to hand over to Andre Obler uh, from the Online Hate Prevention Institute. Okay. Um, Alex is going to shoot me for this, but can I give you a, another stick? Mm, probably not. <laughs> it, there won't be violence, it's just going to be a no. Um, there's a presentation on this stick called Last Minute. The reason it's called Last Minute, the reason the presentation on there is called Last Minute is because it's not actually the presentation I want to present to you now. Um, it's a screenshot, um, if we can pull it up, uh, the, the one on the stick. Let's do this. You um, talk, I'll work on this. It's a screenshot from Facebook from the first talk this morning which we posted on our, our Facebook page. Um, let's bring it up. So this is what I put on our Facebook page. If you're on Facebook, if you go to facebook.com slash online hate, you'll be able to see this live. Um, this is just a, a commentary on the opening, well, one of the, the speeches this morning. But if we go to the next slide, down the bottom you can see a comment we received. Okay, this is in the last hour. 
okay? Um, I thought about starting to compose a reply. Um, one of my moderators in Australia went to just remove this, to hide it. I've unhidden it. Um, I thought, why not open the opportunity up? If people would like to compose a response, you may go to our Facebook page, and I invite you all to have a go at actually answering this. Um, with a room full of experts, simply deleting it and ignoring the question is perhaps not the right response. The right response is to reply. So I put that opportunity out there, and on that note, we can go back to the actual presentation, now that I have one minute left. <laughs> Okay, so it's just online hate on Facebook if you want to find it. Okay, so I'm very briefly in a sentence or two really going to touch on five themes. They relate to abusers of the Holocaust or Holocaust memory, the social media industry, government, civil society, and then what I see as a, a structural challenge in working in this space. So let's look at the abusers. I just have a few examples. I will not spend any time on these. This is a Holocaust denial page, proud to be a Holocaust denier. Here are examples of some of the content on the page. What my organization does in part is we produce briefings where we look at a page like this, extract the examples, explain why they're a problem, and encourage people to then go and report them. Here's another example, that first one, that first one was blatant, proud to be a Holocaust denier, blatant. This next one is claiming that this is a historical site, non-political, not denial, we are just questioning the Holocaust. And here is the content from the page. Okay. We also have things like this. Um, we dealt with the, uh, you can see not only the image, the Kentucky Fried Jews, but also the page comes from 100% concentrated orange Jews, okay, which is also a, a Holocaust reference. Um, when we searched for this image on Google, we found 495 copies of it. So it's very much in circulation. Another example where we see a conflation between new anti-Semitism, Nazism and Israel being conflated symbolically. Um, and then we have this. This was discussed yesterday. Um, there's many other versions of the Anne Frank meme. I'll come back to talk about this when I talk about government. So let's move on to industry. If you talk to the social media companies, they say the problem is not us, the problem is the public. The public is uploading these things. You must go after the individuals who are creating the problem, the individuals who are uploading the content. Based on research we released as a, an interim report at the Global Forum to Combat Anti-Semitism in May, um, we had a sample of 2,200 anti-Semitic uh, items of content from social media. This is the uh, 100, sorry, 200 and something, 230-ish, um, which come from the Holocaust denial category. And we can see that um, YouTube is a particularly large segment of this. We then have taken this research further. We've gone back, we've given the companies the data. Facebook, we offered and they didn't take it. YouTube and Twitter took the data from us and agreed they would go through it again and at a high level they would review it. After they've reviewed it, six months after the report has been out, after we've made this all public, we can see that only 47% of the Holocaust denial on Facebook was removed. But this is actually the best news story if we look at YouTube, only 7% was removed, and YouTube had most of it. If we look at Twitter, 13% was removed. And next to it, you can see, compared to all the categories of anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial on Facebook is actually having a, it has a much higher rate of removal than anti-Semitism has in Facebook on general. Um, this is good news and somewhat surprising because Facebook's official policy to date is still that Holocaust denial is not recognised by Facebook as a form of hate speech. They're on record saying this. So having taken this position that they regard Holocaust denial as not being hate speech and not being in breach of their policy, in actual fact the data shows us they are quite good at removing it. 
um, but we have problems with the other platforms. YouTube, 6% in general, 7% for Holocaust denial, it's about the same. Twitter, 15 and 13%, it's about the same. So we have a particular effort on Facebook to remove Holocaust denial, which should be welcomed. I've skipped over the, the role of the governments here. That example of Anne Frank I showed you and some of the others, my organisation put in a, a report and the Executive Council of Australian Jewry, our peak Jewish community body, our part of the World Jewish Congress, took a formal complaint under a government complaint system against Facebook and after some reconciliation, Facebook agreed to block in Australia all the items in our report. So this is where the government role can come in when we have laws, and these were only civil laws, not criminal laws. Um, but this wasn't done as a complaint against the individuals who uploaded the content. That's what Facebook would have preferred. This was done as a complaint against the company. Um, the civil society discourse, I, I think I have one example here. This was a cartoon from a while ago, prior to the last, uh, the Gaza war. Um, but an Australian charity, which helps refugees and asylum seekers, posted this comment, this cartoon, as commentary during that particular war. They took an old cartoon and posted it. And you can see the numbers. It was shared by, well, 4,000 and what's that, 5,000? Huge numbers. This was being seen by over a million people with the, the moral authority coming from this human rights organisation. Um, it took a lot of work, but they eventually apologised for this. Um, the Jewish community was fairly close and strongly supportive of this community, and that relationship almost vanished overnight as a result of this. So it was resolved, but the fact that something like this could happen is an indication of a problem in the public discourse. Um, the last comment I want to make is to do with the structural challenge. The social media companies they ask for a lot of room to move because social media is the way we protect freedom of speech in the future and they're innovative new companies, etc., etc. The social media companies are not startups anymore, not the major companies. They're some of the world's largest corporations, period, full stop, in any area. The idea that you might stifle innovation if we start regulating now may have been true seven years ago. It is not true today, not if limited to the large companies. The companies have so much clout that corporations are concerned about supporting work which the companies may not be in favour of. Large companies are concerned about this. Organisations that challenge these companies find it difficult to get funding, find it difficult to get support. We're in a, a position where an NGO some years ago may have been if they were challenging the government. Only the primary power these days may not be the government. It may actually be these corporations. So in this setting, we actually need the government's help and the government's power to help balance against the power of large global corporations who, at the moment, some of these companies are not paying tax. They are so large, they manage to dodge the entire taxation system and not contribute to the countries in which they operate. I mean, I find it ridiculous that a company in Australia can pay millions of dollars for advertising online to a company with all the advertising only seen by people in the country that they're trying to advertise to, yet none of this business legally, officially exists in that country. It's all occurring in Ireland or in the Isle of Man or somewhere else where the tax is better. So I will end on that note. Alex is about to walk over. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. I don't know how I've gained that reputation for violence. <laughs> Excellent. Um, the, the questions are coming in fast and thick on Twitter. It does uh, involve us getting through the opening presentations first uh, in order to get to the answering those questions. So uh, I am pleased now to ask Joe Mulhall from Hope Not Hate to share his thoughts on the topic with us. Cheers, yeah. Uh, th thank you for having me. Um, I was very excited to, to hear Professor Bauer's comments about going on to the attack somewhat. Um, I'm here representing an anti-fascist organisation called Hope Not Hate, a British-based one that uh, mainly works in Britain but also does work, work around the world. 
We have both an in intelligence and research department which seeks to undermine and expose the far right and fascist movements as well as Islamist movements, but also looking at community campaigning and attempting to build community resistance. So I was very excited. I go to lots of conferences where we talk about understanding fascism and racism and Holocaust denial, which is very important. You know, we can't defeat something we don't understand. But uh, sometimes it's nice to talk about how what we're going to do about it in terms of going on to the attack. Um, I'll perhaps look at it from the other side. It's been talked about you know, the perpetrators of this sort of stuff putting it online. I was going to be looking at how some people perhaps view it and take it in a different direction, and I'll be very quick. I wanted to start very quickly by saying something positive, as we were talking, as it says uses and misuses, and just use, pick out some statistics of how social media can be uh, you know, successful and has been positive. If I think about Holocaust Memorial Day in the UK, um, I picked out some statistics. Their survivor testimony film this year, Memory Makers, was viewed 70, 72,000 times online. Um, and the stories of Holocaust survivors were shared 7,800 times. Uh, Facebook likes rose by 27% after the 70th anniversary. Twitter followers went up by 61%. Um, the Holocaust Educational Trust, uh, their hashtag Lessons from Auschwitz, again, hundreds of people writing about the inspirational uh, and life-changing events they've experienced there. Um, Hope Not Hate, the organization I work for, has over 171,000 followers on Facebook, um, over 40,000 on Twitter, and hundreds of thousands of people on email. And we use that to talk to our supporters, to interact with our supporters, um, but also to expose people uh, that are doing things wrong. So very briefly, there, there is positive bits to this, but of course all the things that allow us to do good things with social media allow bad people to do bad things. So I will move on to the more depressingly negative bits, and I'm going to talk about Holocaust denial and distortion briefly online. I think the major problem with, that social media creates for this is, is the ability that it's easier than ever before to receive Holocaust denial or to find Holocaust denial online. It's completely free, it's completely widespread. If we take one example of the Institute for Historical Review, probably the largest uh, producer of, of Holocaust material, um, every one of their journals dating back over 20 years is free online. And more worrying is how that some of the things that we saw on those pictures there of Facebook and Twitter um, look extreme, they look, they look, you know, uh, it's very obvious what it is. Sometimes it's the more pernicious aspects of it that look like serious academic journals. And um, because people uh, looking at it, perhaps in the past when one, if one was to buy Holocaust denial material, you had to go to certain bookshops, you had to go to certain, uh, you had to buy them from certain places, often with obvious links to the far right. Nowadays, people go online, they find things, they don't know where it's come from, it looks legitimate, it's got footnotes, it looks like an academic journal, um, and it looks legitimate. And, and I've had examples of this, a I've had a student deliver me an essay this year about post-war population transfer in Germany, talking about this was the real crime and not the Holocaust. And uh, when I pulled him up on it and went through, every, all the references were from the IHR in, in California, when I mentioned to him that these were all well-known Holocaust deniers, he was shocked and rather upset. He had written an essay that I said essentially it was town to mount to a piece of Holocaust denial. Um, he was at a British university, uh, he was, and he was shocked. He was very upset that he had done it. But he said, and he showed me the websites they were on, and of course it was IHR. It looked exactly like the Journal of Contemporary History. You know, it, looked, it came in a journal form. It was, and he hadn't differentiated. So perhaps one of the things we should talk about is how we educate not just about the Holocaust, but how we educate people to differentiate between things to be perhaps slightly more nuanced. Secondly, it was mentioned earlier, it's far easier to buy than ever before. You don't have to go to you know, uh, far-right bookshops. You don't have to go to you know, mail order things that you, perhaps you did in the past. Um, you can go on eBay, uh, you know, or eBay or Amazon, which sells huge amounts of Holocaust denial literature. You can put, you know, Cloud Landsman Shoah in your basket, and then within one click, you're buying. Did the six million really die? You know, uh, it's that easy. So it is not perhaps as easy again to differentiate between legitimate and illegitimate sources. It's not like you w you wouldn't find Holocaust material in a, in a serious bookshop, but you will find it on Amazon, and because these things are really worrying. Um, so it's about standing. So very quickly. Um, also, social media allows networking for these people in a way that I think perhaps has been touched upon, both far-right networks and Islamist networks, uh, the Sharia 4 networks in Europe, propagating these things. And we often talk about online radicalization. Again, it's a, it's a tricky topic, but one, one that's important. Again, in terms of Holocaust now, you know, it's very easy to pick people's roots who can maybe start in me, you know, uh, right-wing anti-immigration movements and slowly radicalize to the point where they're engaging in Holocaust denial, far-right, extreme anti-Semitism, and a lot of this is done online. And the ability for people from anywhere in the world to get in contact in this. No longer do you have to have your little book list like you did in the 80s or 70s, and you, you put it out there and hope that someone might you know, send in their, their, their mail order. Now it's online, you just send them the link. Um, 
Finally, I think we, Godwin's Law was mentioned earlier this morning. I'm kind of rattling through them because I don't want to take too long. Um, Godwin's Law was mentioned earlier this morning um, about does this reduce the uniqueness of the Holocaust in terms of not, not in reality but in people's minds. And I think that's a really interesting debate because trivialization is a real problem. I mean, we mentioned those figures on YouTube. I mean, I've seen Holocaust denial under, or men even just mentions of the Holocaust under videos of Justin Bieber or under videos of footballs, goals. These, these things are everywhere. It becomes pervasive. And it's about questioning whether or not the pervasiveness becomes normalization uh, incorrectly and wrongly. Um, so, and the historical distortions. And, and this isn't just, again, kind of ignorant children. I was at a conference in Nashville last week on the Holocaust. And a, and a supposedly serious scholar stood up and gave a paper called Never Again. And it was about uh, the invasion of Muslims into Europe at the moment and his argument. And he was using the Holocaust here. So it's not just these things. It's about the use and misuse of the Holocaust um, that we see all the time. So to finish, um, yes, education about the Holocaust, I think, is important. Obviously, we have to do more. But also, is it perhaps we need to ask, do we need to educate people about evaluating sources? I mean, maybe that's just the historian in me, but uh, about etiquette online, about when you're finding things, how do you find out whether or not this is a legitimate and serious source? How do you, how do you, how do you perhaps, in a way that you would have uh, done in the old days in a library, how do you wrap this up within the historiography um, to make it? And I think, I think the ADL in America's statistics were that they reckon about 50% of the world's population haven't heard of the Holocaust yet. Um, and actually, scarily, one four quarter of those who have heard of it uh, don't believe it's true. So of that 50% <laughs> that haven't heard of it, increasingly the way that they will find out about it, unfortunately, will not be a book by David Cesarani. It will be underneath a video of Justin Bieber. Um, and then say they, they will be finding these things out online. So the question is, of those 50%, I guess, who will find out through social media and online, what will they be finding out? and how do we try and teach people to then differentiate between the serious sources and the sources that look real but actually are not. Um, that's kind of basically it. Um, I know it looks like horrible form. I'm not actually just um, playing words with friends. I'm, I'm checking for, for questions, and we do have them. I wanted to ask, actually, the first question, not of the panel, but of the audience. We, we saw, um, Andre, you, you, you showed the last minute example from literally an hour ago um, of Facebook in juxtaposition with you showing um, how you, would, you very often request of the social media companies to take things down. In this instance, you were encouraging uh, us to go online and challenge it. Um, I won't ask how many people did that or plan to do that. None but so far. Uh, well, no, okay, fine. <laughs> but the question is, um, maybe just a show of hands. Who, who, feels, who in the room feels that the appropriate thing to do in those types of things is to request that it be taken down? And who feels that the appropriate thing is to challenge it? Okay, so we, it's interesting just to gauge the sentiment of, of the room. I don't know if that, that tells, tells anything. I mean, I think it's more in keeping with what Yehuda uh, was suggesting that we do. Um, but does that you know, sort of pose a, a challenge to, to your work that, that you're, that you're uh, promoting, Andre? Okay, look, we, we make a, a big distinction about the forum. This comment was phrased politely on the page of an anti-hate organisation on a post which was about Holocaust. It was on topic, it was polite, and it was in a forum where one could expect to have a reasonable discussion. The same comment on a Holocaust denial page or on a radical organisation's page, which whatever sort of radical organisation, where there isn't an expectation that we're going to address it seriously, you probably want to just request removal. So it's really about the forum as much as it's about the comment. Got it. That, that's a very helpful distinction. Yeah. I was just going to say on that, um, it's also a matter of practicalities, of course. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you know, Hope Not Hate group, for instance, has you know, nearly 200,000 people, thousands and thousands of comments a day, and they're all the same. You know? And so, you, you know, that kind of, you go, oh, God, look, they've put that up. Um, you could get that 100 times a day, and, and so you can't engage them all. Uh, most of the time, on, for practical reasons, you just wipe them. You know, certainly if it's uh, racist or offensive, you just wipe it, um, because you haven't got time to engage in arguments. Otherwise, you'd do nothing else, you know? Yeah. If, if I can just add to that. Um what we, our, our policy is we have a no platform policy. Um, we ban people, not just remove the comment, but if we see anyone on our page even making a legitimate comment 
and that person is a member of hate groups, we ban them from our page entirely, partly for that resourcing issue. We don't have the time to continuously engage with people that are there to just provoke. So we ban them and we stop them continuing. And we have a very large ban list. Okay. Um, question from Rob Williams on Twitter is, um, what about the dark web? No one's mentioned the dark web. Is, is this uh, an even more you know, uh, concerning environment because it's a, it provides discussion opportunities for violent extremists? Is that something that any of you have engaged in? No. Okay. No, so, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, you go for it. Um, yeah, the dark web is a really, really, really interesting one. Um, Tor networking generally. Um, of course, it's vast. The problem is, is it's, it's very difficult. You can't, you can't search it in the same way you, you, know, you traditionally would. There's a really, really good book out by uh, Jamie Bartlett, who's at Demos, if anyone's interested, called The Dark Web. And um, there's no question that this thing goes online. There's, I mean, there's a, one of the most extreme groups in Britain at the moment, a small group called National Action. Their briefing documents are all about how, how to use the the, the dark web to keep away from both governments and anti-fascist organizations. Um, how we combat it is something that needs to be a conversation that's had. It hasn't really happened um, either. I, I don't presume governments are looking at it, but yeah, it's something that has to be talked about because at the moment, I must admit, I'm completely clueless on how we would go about combating things on the dark web. Let, finding them, let alone combating yeah. them, is the issue, I think. So, yeah. what is the dark web? Oh, right. Um, sorry, yeah, the, the dark web is... Um, the dark web is, is the, the unsearchable, on the internet, they, the estimates say that about 97% of the content that sits on the, on the internet is not searchable through Google. It doesn't have official web addresses. It's called the dark web because it's, it's usually you have to go through certain routers, a thing called, you know, called the Tor router, so everything is untraceable. Uh, so you, and it doesn't have traditional web pages or search engines, and it all sits below what we would call it doesn't it's Google, Facebook, etc. So basically, it's a, it's the internet that you can't search. You know, some of it's completely innocuous. Some of it is family pages with pictures of their friends. Uh, a lot of it is selling drugs, guns, racism, Islam, you know, that sort of stuff. And and I I, I do need to challenge that you know the premise of of your question was because you are old, you don't know what the dark web is. First of all, I don't consider you to be old, but. Um, but uh, I, I do feel like we, we generally, we've had you know, various conferences over the past few years on the, you know, where we touch on digital topics. And I do need to sort of shift the, the conventional wisdom that uh, this is a, a topic for young people. Um, and, and I hope that many in the, in the room of all ages will agree with me. I mentioned Yehuda earlier challenging me on, uh, on not being switched on enough. Um, but. Uh, Raphael Pankowski, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, I'll start with you for the next question. I noticed that most of what we, what we talk about has this sense of alarm and, and um, this sort of moral panic that I described. I understand that, looking at the statistics and the examples, I see where that comes from. But it, I think it's also worth saying that a digitally connected world, there's an argument to be made that it, it, um, it has the capacity to make the world a, safer place for vulnerable groups. We can transmit uh, information about atrocities in real time as, as, they're happen as they are happening. Wh what do, how do you assess the, the sort of the positive side of, of digital connectedness? Does it counterbalance these negatives? Hmm. Well, it's an interesting point. I'm afraid, personally, I, I'm much more pessimistic. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, but what you said reminded me of a, of a Polish politician, ex-Prime Minister of Poland, who, who made a speech about Jan Karski once. Uh, I don't need to explain who Jan Karski was in, in this room, well, the, the, the man who brought the, the news of the Holocaust to the West from occupied Poland. And uh, this Polish politician said, well, unfortunately, Jan Karski failed in his mission because there was no Facebook. Uh, at that time. If he had Facebook, he, he could just put it all on Facebook and inform the global community about the Holocaust. I thought that's simplistic and naive, and I'm not sure this is the right way to think about, uh, about, about uh, technology. I mean, obviously, there is a potential there for all of us who are on the, on the good side. Uh, but I'm afraid it is simply the biggest uh, tool and the biggest opportunity
for for racist and, and anti-Semites in in modern history, the, the technological development, which I think nobody has really fully grasped yet. And one very important aspect of all this is is is, is the limits of acceptable debate. That this is what we are talking about in a way uh, that are shifted enormously because of Facebook and well, all the other all the other tools all the other platforms and I think that the key to to this uh, is the transnational or the global nature of the of the phenomenon and uh, this transnational character of 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 online communication it's it's often an excuse for not applying uh, the, the, the national legal framework or the European legal framework. Um, and of course, uh, anti-Semitic hate speech and Holocaust denial is illegal in my country. It is illegal in most European Union countries. Uh, um, I cannot see the reason why the limits of debate should be shifted uh, uh, simply because there is, uh, there is a development of technology that affects us all, supposedly preventing us from respecting the laws of, of, of our countries. I, and I think this is very important. Very good. Joe, you wanted to make a quick comment? Yeah, and very, very quick point. I think it's very important to talk about the limitations of social media, to talk about the positives. Yes, there are some really exciting positives, but I, I do think that sometimes, certainly within academic circles, there's this idea that it's all going to solve the world because everyone can befriend each other on Facebook and and there is real limitations. A huge amount of this, of course, is preaching to the converted. Um, uh, the people that join you know, my organization's anti-racism Facebook page are on the whole already anti-racist. The people who go to Auschwitz and hashtag uh, you know, things are already not anti-Semites. Um, and so I think we have to marry online with offline. I don't think any of this is going to work just online. We have to go back into communities, we have to knock on doors, we have to combat people, we have to speak to people that, that wouldn't join our Facebook page. Um, it's about how do we reach those people, because otherwise we end up all feeling great the whole time and going, aren't we brilliant? Um, look how many Facebook followers we've got and look how many times they retweeted my post about being not racist. Well, they're already not racist, so if we're going to actually go out and combat fascism, anti-Semitism and racism, then we have to think well beyond just talking to our own friends, I think. Very briefly, Andre. Um, which, again, I think comes back to why I would respond to that comment which we showed before, rather than just deleting it, because that's the opportunity to actually reach out. Um, but what I wanted to say was, if the, you know, if the news of the Holocaust was able to have been spread through Facebook, Goebbels would also have had access to Facebook if the technology was there. And, frankly, the power imbalance involved in the Nazi structure and their ability to use the technology as they used the early IBM computers. I mean, the trains were run by computer. Um, the numbers were computer references. If they'd had that technology as well of Facebook, I mean, I don't know where we would be now. Um, but also, if we talk about the cost or benefit, we don't have to look at the Holocaust. We can look at Daesh and Syria and what's happening now. and. We have the technology there to spread the message, and it is being used to cause major problems in countries around the world. So the technology by itself is, is not a solution. The technology is just a channel. It's like the introduction of the automobile solved the problem of mobility. So suddenly food can move more quickly, people can move more quickly. This didn't get rid of the problem of unemployment. It didn't get rid of the problem of starvation. It did lead to road traffic accidents and a, a road death toll, which didn't really exist in the same context before. So the technology has positive benefits, but it comes with a, a risk and with its own problems. Thank you for that. Um, I, it's, not, it's not my uh, role to sort of be a, an enthusiast for the home team, but Joe, because uh, you know, I am a, a supporter of Hope Not Hate re living in the UK, I, it's interesting to hear you say that most people who are already anti-racist are sharing this stuff. because. Hope Not Hate did actually play a, a pretty significant role, I, I think, in, in seeing the end of the British National Party, the largest, at the time, far-right party in the UK, largely through, I think, its online presence, which was entirely sort of positive and occasionally calling them out on their, you know, on their uh, negative, you know, yeah, racist to, to an extent, it gives, uh, the online presence <laughs> gives, gives one the ability to expose uh, and to undermine 
certainly far-right parties that are saying that they're not racist, etc., and, and to get the message out. I would actually argue that, uh, that you know, if, if we did have an impact on, on those elections, for instance, it was actually the, the hundreds and hundreds of people that went out every weekend, knocked on doors and spoke to people on the doorstep. Um, I think that's how you'd feel. Don't get me wrong, I'm not undermining the value yeah. of social media. It can do remarkable things, but um, I think it's... And, and I guess in terms of this conversation here, it, the, the, I'm proud to be a Holocaust tonight. I'm not sure how, how many people are convinced by those websites. I think more interesting is, is the, although, although they have to be combated, I think more interesting is those ones that look serious, that look real, that those are the websites that can convince people the other way. I think that's an interesting discussion about how do we deal with them, you know? Well, this has been a fascinating look at the, the range of different uh, ways that we can look at the issue of, of digital media and its, uh, the uses and misuses of, of the Holocaust there. Um, please join me in thanking our panel once again. Thank